OK, everyone. Good afternoon again. Uh, welcome. Um, so at the end of yesterday morning, the end of yesterday morning, um, so we did the, the final topic in the differentiation chapter um, yesterday morning by looking at some uh, examples of kinematics problems. And then I finished uh, yesterday morning's session by, and you can find a link to it here from the top of the uh, G plus page, we did a, we started to investigate what's going to be a, a motivating example for us for looking at uh, group theory. Okay? So group theory is this final chapter which we have to, have to do in my half. And just very, very succinctly, what is a group? A group is a mathematical object. It's a set, it's a certain set of elements, and it's, it's in the situation where you have an operation on those elements, a so-called binary operation, which takes a pair of elements from the group, takes an ordered pair of elements from the group, combines them to give you a third element. Okay? And these things called groups crop up in lots of areas of mathematics. And the operation and the type of elements that you have in your group can take many different forms. Okay? Um, from numbers and number-like objects to vector-like objects, matrix-like objects, or function-like objects, and lots of different things. Okay? So before we get into the chapter as it is in the notes and start looking at the formal definition of what a group is, I'm, choose, I'm using this example as a way of kind of uh, getting into the subject. Okay? So what we're focusing on here, so without mentioning anything to do with, you know, with without going through the ins and outs of the group aspect of it to begin with, we're just going to focus on the square. Everybody knows what a square is. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly review what we, what we covered yesterday, yesterday morning. Everybody knows what a square is, and what we're examining here are the symmetries of the square. You can repeat this kind of thing for any kind of geometric object. So it's an example of a very general thing, which you, where you look at the symmetries of an object and the group formed by the symmetries. So what are the elements? So th this group is a group of elements. The, the individual elements in the group are the symmetries of the square. Okay? And they come in two flavors. There's rotational symmetries of the square and reflectional symmetries. So very briefly, you've got three, three non-trivial rotations of the square. You can rotate it by 90 degrees in an anti-clockwise direction, rotate it by 180 degrees, or 270 degrees. If you rotate it all the way around by 360 degrees by an angle of 2 pi radians, of course, that's the same as leaving it the same. Rotating everything by 2 pi is the same as leaving everything in the same position to begin with. But those are all symmetries of the square because those operations, those rotations, leave the square as being the same square. It moves the individual points around a bit, but the whole square is still in the same position as it was beforehand. Okay, so we've got three non-trivial rotations, and you can think of the this special symmetry, which every shape has, the identity symmetry. You can think of that as being a rotation through a, through an angle of zero or two pi or whatever. Okay, then the square also has many reflectional symmetries. It's got four axes of symmetry through opposite vertices and midpoints of opposite sides. You can reflect the square in any of those axes of symmetry, and it will still be the same square. So those are our eight objects. The identity, three non-identity rotations, and four reflections. So there's eight elements of this group. Now, what's the operation between them? Now, you won't be able to take all this down, because we went through this yesterday, but the, but the notes are up on the G plus page. The operation between them is that of a composition of functions. That's the natural operation to use um, when you're composing functions. So when you combine any of these two symmetries with the composition, you again get another symmetry. If you've got two operations that leave the square unchanged, after composing them, after running them together, you again get another operation which leaves the square unchanged. So taking any two of these eight symmetries, composing them, that should give another one of the eight symmetries. And this gives us our system with the operation of composition. And it takes elements from the system, from the group, 
combines them using composition and gives you another element of the group. Now, we're going to examine this in detail in, in the case of the, the square and reach a complete picture or just description of how the operation and the symmetries behave. But first of all, we need an efficient notation. At the moment, I've got eight different symbols, E, the three R rotation symbols, and the three reflection symbols. In fact, I can do a lot better. I can actually represent everything by just using three symbols. I have E to represent the identity transformation. I have E to represent the identity transformation. And if I use R to represent the rotation by a quarter turn, I can represent the other rotations as R squared and R cubed. Right? For R squared represents R composed with R. R cubed represents R composed with R composed with R. OK? I need a symbol S to represent one of the reflections. And we did this calculation yesterday. So if I let S be S1, so S1 here is reflection in the horizontal axis of symmetry. If I compose R with S, we did this calculation. If you compose R with S, you get S2. And in a similar way, if you compose R squared with S, you get the third reflection, S3. If you compose R cubed with S, you get the, the fourth reflection, S4. And making our notation a bit more compact, we'll omit putting in the circle symbol. So we'll understand a product written as xy to denote x composed with y, just to make the notation even more compact. Under these considerations, the elements of D4 now become these elements here. So I can generate them all just using uh, the two symbols, r and s, and the identity. Okay? You've got e, r, r squared, r cubed. They're all the rotations. And s, r, s, r squared, s, and r cubed, s are the are the four reflections. Well, because that requires, well, why not? Because that's using four different labels for them, OK? Whereas here, I'm being more efficient. I'm representing everything using just two labels and repeating them as r squared and r cubed. And also, if, if you just label them, if you just keep them named separately, you're not seeing any of the link, the structural link between them. Whereas, so if you stick with the label R and S1 and S2, you're not seeing what the link between them is. And, and the link between them is, is that when you compose R after S, you get another one of the reflections. So it's kind of best to see that represented in the notation that you use. So that's why. I mean, on, on the face of it, maybe sticking with S1, S2, S3, S4, maybe it might seem simpler or cleaner notation. But, but this notation is telling you more. It's kind of showing the connections between them a bit more. So it's, it's more mathematically interesting, let's say. OK, that's a good question. So to continue this, here are, I, I've got this nice, efficient description of our, of our eight elements. And I've written down here, next, what we're going to do is study the multiplication table. In, uh, in D4. Because that's if you've got a small group with a relatively manageable number of elements, what you can do is look at the multiplication table in the group to completely see how the operation is behaving on all of the elements, OK? So I'll put a little, I'll, put a, I'll label this D4. This is the group I'm looking at. The convention is we put a little. Uh, symbol to denote what the operation is in the top left. And just like, um, well, you, you, you list all the elements in the group across the top. As labels, God, this takes ages to appear each time, as labels for the columns. And you list the elements of the group again down here as labels for the rows, we just keep the chatter down a bit. It's, quite, it's getting a bit too loud. Thank you. Now, I know I spent an awful lot of time. They seem to 
get us to do this day after day in primary school to write out multiplication tables where you write all the numbers 1 to 10 and 1 to 10 and you fill the table with either adding them up or multiplying them out. Well, this is just exactly the same idea. Just doing a multiplication table for the group. But because of the remark we've made already about symmetries, I've said when you compose any two symmetries of the square, you get another symmetry of the square. So everything going in the entry of this table here will be one of the eight elements. Okay? So we need to figure out the correct entry to put in here. We also need a convention about which exact element goes in here. Because you know, in the element in this position here, in row R and column S, do I mean R after S or S after R? What's the convention about ordering them? Well, the convention is, just do a little sketch down here, if you've got a row label and a column label, the entry which goes in the corresponding cell is X composed with Y. So you have the, the row label on the left and the column label on the right. So that's an important convention. It's important because, as we'll see, this operation isn't co uh, commutative is the word. An operation is commutative if it doesn't matter in what order the inputs go in. But here the order is significant for at least some of the combinations. Okay? So we do need to agree on what the convention is for, for which entry goes in row X and column Y. OK, so let's start filling in the table. Um, let's, go, let's fill it in row by row. If you compose anything with the identity transformation, and from the work we did with functions, we know that if you take the identity function, compose it with any other function, it leaves the other function unchanged. So all of these elements across here are just the column labels repeated. Okay. Leads into visibility very slowly. Okay, let's look at the second row. Now we want to compose, we want to do R after, so taking this R here, we want to do R after each of the column headings. So R after the identity. If you do the identity first and then rotate it, well, that's just the same as rotating it. Because the identity leaves it completely fixed. R after R, if you rotate it by a quarter turn and then rotate it by a quarter turn, well, you've rotated it twice by a quarter turn. That's the rotation R squared. Similarly, R after R squared is R cubed. What's R after R cubed? E, it's the identity. If you rotate the square three clicks and then rotate it a further fourth click, you've rotated it all the way around. It's the same as not rotating it at all. You get the same effect as not, ro not rotating it at all. R after S, well, our calculate, we, by, by the notation we're using, R after S is simply represented as R after S. It's the second of the, second of the four reflections we've identified. R after R S is simply R squared S. And R after R cubed S is, R after R squared S is R cubed S. And then what's R after R cubed S? S, yeah. Good, so there's all our operations with R on the left. In a similar way, you can do them all with R squared on, R squared on the left. So you have R squared, R cubed, Okay, you'd be tempted to write down there r to the power of 4, but of course that's the identity. r squared after r cubed would give you r to the power of 5, but r to the power of 4 is the identity. So r to the power of 5 is the same as the identity after r, so it's just r. r squared after s is r squared s. r squared after r s is r cubed s. r squared after r squared s is r to the power of 4 s which is the same as S, because S is E is the identity. R, R to the power of 4 is the identity. And R squared after R cubed S is R to the power of 5S, which is the same as RS.
Okay, so quickly fill in the, uh, the next row yourselves. You finished? Just composing it with R each time. You should see something. You should see that. Okay, it hasn't been too hard so far because we've been composing things with rotations. We've been composing these elements with rotations on the left, but, but that's the natural kind of notation system we're using anyway, always putting the rotation part on the left. So it's been pretty easy to figure out. Um, we start to have something to evaluate now. Because S after E, okay, that's simply S, the reflection S. What do you get if you compose S with R? Well, I'd be tempted to just write down SR, S on the left, R on the right, except that's not one of, or that doesn't agree with one of the eight notations for the elements, right? But S after R must be one of the symmetries, must be one of these eight symmetries. If you reflect it, sorry, if you rotate it first and then reflect it, that's a symmetry. They're both symmetries, so composing them should give a symmetry. So composing them must be one of these things up here. So let's go back to our actual square and see if we can figure it out. Here's your square. I want to, so I'm doing S after R. SR, so I want to do, I want to rotate it first. That will make it a square. And then I want to reflect it in S. Remember, S was reflection in the horizontal axis. So what's the combined effect of doing these two? Well, you can track the, what's happening to the, your particular square by numbering the vertices or numbering the sides or something. When you rotate it, one quarter turn anti-clockwise moves the vertices to these positions, doesn't it? And then when you reflect it in the horizontal axis, it moves the vertices to these positions, the two and three swap positions and the one and four swap positions. So there it is from beginning to end, S after R. Well, which, of our eight, which of our eight symmetries is that? Well, if you compare the beginning with the start with the end, you see one and three are still in the same positions but two and four have swapped. So this symmetry S after R is nothing but reflection in that diagonal axis there. And if you go back to our original, if you go back to our original square, you'll see that that's the one we labeled as R cubed S. This is the one we labeled as S, um, so we had S1, S2, S3. That was the one we labeled as S4. But it's the symmetry R cubed S. Another way to think about it is R inverse S. It's the same as reflecting it in the horizontal axis. So if you look at R inverse S, got one, two, three, four. First you do S, which reflects it in the horizontal axis. So you have two here, one, three, and four. What do I mean by R inverse? By, by R inverse, what's the operation that undoes a rotation of a quarter turn anti-clockwise? We just rotate it back, rotate it a quarter turn clockwise. So R inverse re refers to a quarter turn clockwise which would move these vertices here to 1, 2, 3, 4. So you see that doing R inverse after S is the same thing as doing S after R. That's, uh, that's just not, that's not something special about the square. That's kind of a universal, well, in, in two dimensions anyway, that's a general factor, a universal property. I'll just be safe and say in two dimensions. Any rotation R, any reflection S, 
it's always the case that SR is equal to R inverse S. It's not just anything special about this particular rotation of the square or this particular reflection. It actually holds in general. And by extension, that will also imply that S after R to any power M is R inverse to the power M after S, just by applying it repeatedly. <clears throat> this, you can take the first rule is telling you how to move the R past the S. The R moves past the S to become an R inverse on the other side. So if you've got M R's here, you move each of them past S, they each become an R inverse. You've R inverse to the power M. Or another way of writing that is R to the minus M, S. By convention, R to the minus M refers to R, the inverse transformation, R inverse to the power M. The, it makes sense to use the rules of indices like that. That's just a convention. By, by convention, any, well, it, it holds the same for any function. A, R to the minus M is the same as R, the inverse transformation, R inverse to the power M. Okay. These powers, of course, we're always talking about repeated compositions. Okay. Okay, so we've identified this, we, we embarked on this to find out which elements to put in the Cayley table, in the multiplication table. So S after R is the same as R cubed S. Okay. So we can continue our, our multiplication table now. Everybody finished with that page? Yeah? So S after R is R cubed S. S after R squared will be, um, well, what's, what's S, after, S after R squared? Which one's that? E? It's not E. If you compose a reflection and a rotation, it has to be another reflection. It's R squared S, yeah. Because the R2, S after R squared, it becomes R inverse squared S, but that's just the same as R squared S. The inverse of, the inverse of R squared is just R inverse squared. Okay? So this is R squared S. And so S after R cubed must be the other must be the other reflection we haven't listed yet, which is R S. What's S after S? E. Yeah. If you, if you if you reflect something in an axis and then reflect it again in the same axis, it's just back to where it started, isn't it? S after S is E. S after Rs, R cubed, well, that's good, that's quick. So uh, how did you work out that that was R cubed? S, S after Rs, well, you see, we, we know what S after R is, so we can turn this, this SR here into R inverse S, Oops, sorry, I meant to just underline those first two. So I've used the rule, I'm turning SR into R inverse S here. But then you've got S after S beside each other here, which is we've already decided is the identity. And R inverse, rotating one click anti-clockwise, sorry, rotating one click clockwise is the same as rotating three clicks anti-clockwise. That's equal to R cubed. That's R cubed. S after R squared S is going to be um, R squared. And S after R cubed S is going to be R. Okay, so that's how our multiplication table is developing there. So we can hand, from, from now on, we can handle all of the difficult products 
we can handle all of the difficult products from now on by using this by using this relation that SR is equal to R R inverse S. Yeah. And the fact that R to the power of four is the identity. And by working out the inverse rotations like this. Okay. So we'll keep going here just to To see the rest of this table, so we've got RS after the identity is RS. RS after R, well, SR becomes R inverse S, so RS after R is just S. RS after R squared is R cubed S. And RS after R cubed is R squared S. Rs after S is just R, because the two S's beside each other cancel. S after S is the identity. Rs after Rs, well, that's the same reflection composed with itself, so that gives the identity. You're just doing the same reflection twice. Rs after R, Q, R squared S, so how do, you, how do you handle that? Rs after R squared S. When you move these two R's in the middle past, past that S there, becomes R, R inverse, R inverse, SS. The SS is the identity. This R and R inverse cancel, so the whole thing is R inverse, which is R cubed. So that's R cubed there. Then RS after R cubed S, well, I know that must be R squared. Okay, so why don't you just take a just take a minute or two, two, three, four minutes maybe to figure out the last two rows. Talk about it if you need be, and, and we'll just uh, we'll confirm them. You can speed yourself up. You can sometimes speed up because you'll notice notice that every row we have lists all of the eight elements once and only once. That's a general property that always holds true with these group multiplication tables. So once you get to the end, you, you, you always know what the last one has to be. It's just the one you haven't listed yet. Okay? We'll be able to explain why that's true in general after a while. Okay, so you work on completing the, the last two rows. I'll, I'll do them here as well, and then we can compare them. I reveal them. You finishing them? Which which symmetry? Can you use symmetries in the table? Somebody answer her. You mean this symmetry from? Well, can you? Kind of. There there, there are several patterns here. Sorry. The, Four separate. Oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah. What are you talking about there? You're talking about rotation composed with rotation always gives a rotation. 
Rotation with the reflection always gives another reflection. And reflection with rotation gives another reflection. And composing two reflections always gives another rotation. That's true as well. That's a very good observation. So those four quadrants. There's, there's our last two rows, anyway. So yeah, so there's a, there's a number of things to pick out here. Just what you were referring to there was the fact that you've got these four blocks here. A rotation composed with a rotation always gives another rotation. You just rotate it a bit, rotate it some more. That combined effect is a rotation. Rotation composed with a reflection always is another reflection. And similarly, when you compose them the other way. And if you compose two reflections, if you reflect in one axis and then reflect in another axis, you can kind of reason that that has to be a rotation. You can kind of think in terms of left-handed and right-handed things. If you, if you reflect a left-handed thing, it becomes a right-handed thing. And if you reflect it, even in some different axis, it will become a right-handed thing again. So the combined effect can't be a reflection. So doing two different reflections kind of undo, undoes the reflective nature of the thing and means that the combined effect has to be a rotation. One thing to notice about this table is some symmetry that it lacks. It, it isn't symmetric across this leading diagon across this diagonal. Sometimes it is. This, this, the, the top block here and, no, just this top block here is symmetric across this diagonal. Can you see that there? It's always the same entry either side of, either side of the diagonal in the same position. However, that's not true across these two blocks, and it's not true across this block here. In general, composition is not, composition is not commutative. That means in general, i.e., when you take x composed with y, in general, that's not equal to y composed with x. It will be in certain special circumstances. We've already seen if you, well, yeah, if, if, you, if you have two different two-dimensional rotations around the same fixed point and compose them, they will always be the same no matter what, which order you do them in. But in general, in general not. Is it like this? Is that is that what you're suggesting? Is it? It is, yes. Yeah, that's a very nice observation. So why is that? I mean this so if you're matching this R cubed here with this R cubed here. Well, there are different pairs of elements that you're composing. So it's, maybe it's not so, not so immediately obvious how to describe that symmetry. Well, it's a very good, uh, okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a nice observation. Be interesting to see if that also holds true in other dihedral groups. To be honest, off the top of my head, I don't know, because you'd have to think a bit about how to precisely describe that. So just the term dihedral, so I've done this thing for the square. You can obviously repeat it. Okay, so can also study the symmetries. The symmetry groups, these are symmetry groups of regular polygons. The regular polygons are the regular n-sided figures. So you've got the regular triangle, the square, the pentagon, the hexagon. How many names do you know? Heptagon is seven. Octagon is eight. Nonagon? Nonagon? Decagon? Ten? What's eleven? There is no... what? 
what's 12? Do you know 12? Dodecagon. I think there's a whole menagerie of these names. I'm not familiar with many of them. So this is for index 3, index 4, 5, 6. And the groups are called, in just the general term for them are is dihedral groups. Um, the one we've done is, is the square. It's called D4. D3 would be for the triangle. D5 for the pentagon. The general list of elements would be listing the elements follows the same pattern as for the square. You will always have the identity, you will always have rotate you will always have a basic rotation. Now what's that what's that basic rotation? If you're talking about the n sided regular polygon, this will be rotation by 2 pi over n. That will be rotating your n-sided polygon one click anti-clockwise, say. Then you will have r squared, two clicks, r cubed, all the way up as far as rn minus 1. You don't need to write down r to the power n. When you rotate the thing n clicks, that's rotating it all the way around. So that's the same as the identity. So that's already listed there, so you don't need to list it again. You'll have, one ref you'll have a reflection S. This is any named reflection. When I set up the one for the square, I named S as the reflection in the horizontal axis. There's nothing special about the horizontal axis. Could have chosen any of our any of the other axes of reflection. The other reflections then you can represent as R S, R squared S, etc., all the way up as far as R N minus one S. So in general, the the elements follow the same pattern as they have done for the square. You've got n different reflections. And if you count the identity as an honorable rotation, rotation by zero degrees, you've got n, n rotations. n minus one non-trivial ones and one trivial, uh, trivial identity. So this is our first example of, of a group or a, a family of groups. There are these systems of elements with, an op with a natural operation between them. This is compositions, uh, composition of the, op of, the, of the symmetries. And so what are we going to study in this group theory, group theory chapter? We're going to look at groups in general. Groups arise in a number of different contexts. Context. Number-like groups, groups of functions as the objects, groups with matrices as the objects, groups with vector-like things as the objects, so in lots of, different, lots of different contexts. And group theory, I guess, is the study of what's common to all those different contexts. What general facts or what general things can you say about systems of elements combined with an operation? That's, that's, the, study, that's the study of group theory. Um, but before we leave it, I just want to illustrate some of the illustrate one idea. So with your table of D4, what we'll do is we'll observe the presence of what's called subgroups. What's a subgroup? A subgroup is like a little group living inside the big group. Okay. The so subgroups of D4. So these are these are subsets subsets of elements that behave as small groups of 
And this, in particular, means that they're closed under the operation, closed under the operation of the composition. So that when you compose elements in this subset H, you only get another element in H. So can anybody see any of those in, in D4? Looking at your table, can you observe any subset of the elements that remain closed under the operation and act like a little group within the larger group? Be brave, shout, you know. Any ideas? Yeah, good. The top left, yeah, if you take all the rotations together. All the rotations, in, including E, E, R, R squared, R cubed, if you just ignore everything else, this is like a little group multiplication table. So the, you've, got the, you've got H consisting of all the rotations, E, R, R squared, R cubed. Any other ones? Any, anybody spot another one? Another subset which remains closed. S and E, yeah, that's a good one. If you take the identity and any, well, and the reflection S, that has a nice multiplication table. That's its multiplication table there. It's a little subset which is closed under the operation. And there's another, well, there's three other examples like that. You take the identity in any reflection. Yeah? Are there any others? There's at least one more I can think of. Well, at least two more I can think of. E and? Well, the set E and R isn't closed, is it? Because if you compose R with itself, you get R squared, which is going outside the set. Yeah? Just E, that's very good. The trivial group. E by itself is a nice example of a group. It's got very simple... It's not a particularly interesting group. It's got only got one thing in it, and when you square it, you still get the same thing. But it's a, it fits the definition. It is a subgroup. It's called a trivial group. But the trivial subgroup. There's at least one more. I think pretty much only one more left. E and R squared. Good. E and R squared. That multiplication table is. Oops. R squared. E. R squared. R squared. E. That acts like a little. A little group living inside the large one. Um, I, I think there might be one more. I think there's one more. Can you allow in any of the reflections? Oh yeah, there's one more hidden in there. There's one more example. I think you can take E, R squared, S, and R squared, S. E, R squared, S, R squared, S, E, R squared, S, and R squared, S. Am I right? Get R squared, E, R squared, S. When you compose R squared with R squared, S, you get S. Yeah, I'm right. So this is R squared, S, uh, S. Uh, R squared and E. 
that's that's the last subgroup. I wonder is this enough? I wonder is there enough here to to um, this this neat this kind of illustrates the the very last thing we're going to do in the group chapter. The very last thing we're going to do in the group chapter is prove a, an important well a very nice general result which applies to all groups all finite groups. It's a, it's a result called uh, Lagrange's theorem. What do you notice about the size of these subgroups? What sizes are we seeing here? Well, we're seeing, a, well, the trivial one is one element. You've got some examples with two elements and some examples with four elements. One, two, and four are the only sizes of elements we're seeing there. They relate to the size of the whole group. In the whole group, you've got eight elements. So we make this observation that we always have the size of the subgroup divides the size of the, the divides the number of elements in D4. So H, this uh, sticking lines either side of a set denotes the, um, the number of elements in it. So the size of H, the size of the subgroup divides the size of the group. That's true for all finite groups. If you, if you ever have a finite group, the only possible sizes for the subgroups are things that divide the order of the group. That's called uh, Lagrange's theorem. And that'll be the results we're going to prove at the very end. But it applies to any group whatsoever in, in, in any of the contexts that groups arise in. OK, so when I see you next week, we'll, we'll start going through the material in the notes on, on groups and uh, doing it in a more formal way. But this is just our first, uh, first uh, workout with it, so to speak.